like to sit next to you this way. We usually kind of yes. look at each other. Are you live streaming? I'm live streaming right now. From that? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Careful what you say. This is going. Where's this going? Every place? Global. We've got 12 extra viewers. Ah, uh, okay. Great. Welcome to all those. See, there are Zafus. There are some Zafus in the front. If anybody wants to sit on the floor, I just noticed that you can't see them. If you have young, healthy legs and you yeah. wish to do that. <laughs> So welcome from us as well. We're just um, delighted to be uh, here for this special evening. And um, I actually wanted to have a copy of both of our latest books so I could hold up one that said, Is Patience Real Happiness? Ah, okay. We, ah, there we are. There we are. Props. Here we go. Let's see. You're reading this way, right? Is that right? Is Real happiness, <laughs> because that is um, that's what we're going to look at this evening. So, how about we start with a little sitting? Let me just ask first if anyone is uh, at CMC for the first time this evening. Oh, great, wonderful, welcome. And if you're here for the hundred and first time, welcome to you as well. And is anyone kind of new to meditation? Just kind of beginning your practice. Great. Great, great, great. So, I will um, guide us through this. And we'll just have a short sitting. And even as I'm speaking now, if you'd like to settle in and become comfortable. And if you'd like to sit with your eyes closed, that's great. If you prefer to have them open, let them just take a soft focus in front of you perhaps about six feet in front. And you want to find that, that middle ground that is both relaxed and comfortable, with a sense of ease and letting go, and at the same time, very alert and aware, awake. In this tradition, we call that the state of mindfulness. And it's a balance between very calm and relaxed and at the same time awake and aware, really present. You may have had a busy day. You may have come in with things on your mind. And how wonderful it is that we'll have a few minutes now to just let anything go that we don't need. Just kind of with a deep breath, we just let it go. So that your presence is a joyful experience, light, spacious. of concentration is the sensations of the breath. So just bring your awareness gently to the sensations of the in-breath and the out-breath. There is nothing to fix and nothing to change whether the breath is long or short, or is deep or shallow, or smooth or rough, just notice. Again, there's nothing to fix because there's nothing broken. The body knows how to breathe. just gently guided back to the sensations of the breath. And let your awareness rest very gently on those sensations. Each 
time you notice that the mind has wandered is a wonderful moment because it's a moment of mindfulness. So again, you just bring your awareness gently back to the sensations of the breath. And just try to follow the sensations of one breath. The sound of the bell will indicate the end of this sitting. But as you come out of the sitting, let it not be the end of your practice of mindfulness. Even as you move your fingers and your toes and stretch a bit, be very mindful of what each of those sensations is like. See if you can even feel the sensations of your eyelids as your eyes open. I think there's some chairs over here. Empty chair next to you. You have a few people coming in. <coughs> the microphone will go put because I have a big habit of touching microphones. Okay, is anybody looking for a chair up front or is up there? Hi. There's a chair here. Okay. Excellent. 
so welcome, or I think you should be welcoming me perhaps uptown where I hardly ever venture. Although this is the second time this week I was in uptown. And tomorrow I'm going to Brooklyn. So this is the, uh, my exotic, exotic travel. Life. But I'm, I'm really delighted to be here, to be with Alan, to have the chance to explore this topic. So I'm just going to talk for a little bit, and Alan will speak, and then um, we might speak to each other <laughs> briefly, and then turn it over to you for questions or comments. Or, and then I'll close the evening with, with another meditation practice. So I realized, sort of looking over my, especially my writing uh, life, and to some extent my teaching life, that one of the things that I seem to have been devoted to, but not in a conscious way at first, was to take words that either I feel are, are being misconstrued or, or misunderstood or um, that could really serve us, concepts that could serve us and enhance our lives in some ways, except the concepts seem too distant and the words seem too distorted in some way. I began writing by writing this book, which I saw out there, Loving Kindness. And as the years go by, I realized that was some time ago now, because it came out in 1995. Mm -hmm. And the word loving kindness is a translation from a word in the Pali language, language of the original Buddhist text. And the word in Pali is metta, M-E-T-T-A. You'll also see outside some literature from my retreat center, the center I co-founded, the Insight Meditation Society, which is a large brick building with white pillars. You'll see that up in some of the, the graphics there on, on the flyers. And up above the doorway, it says Metta, M-E-T-T-A, of the, the building. So loving kindness is the common translation of the word. I always felt a little concerned about it as a translation because as a word it's not something we tend to use just casually in conversation and so I was afraid that that distance might make the the quality of the heart itself seem removed from day-to-day -day life and somewhat arcane and precious in the negative sense of the word. Uh, it actually means friendship. So loving kindness is developing the art of friendship first of all toward ourselves, and ultimately toward all of life. So that was the first word I kind of went out into the world with, in a kind of big way, saying, let's look at love, let's look at kindness. So many times I think we're taught that kindness is a kind of secondary virtue, like if you can't be brilliant, and you can't be courageous, <laughs> and you can't be wonderful, it's like, okay, be kind. You know, it's like it's nice. It's not great, but it's good. You know, it's, it's sort of good. And yet, when we really examine the quality of the heart, when we reflect on people who have truly been kind to us in a non-conditioned way, when we look at the nature of friendship, which endures, which sustains us, then it's not something we find kind of pathetic or or pitiable as a quality. So reclaiming the word actually changes our appreciation for what is strength, what is not strength, but maybe portrayed as strength in a conventional way. Like does revenge and obsession really make us stronger? <clears throat> what is aloneness? How much is it true? How much is it just a construct? of this world, of this mind, what we're taught. How much separation is there? How much independence is there? How much interdependence is there? All of that is involved in a very deep investigation as to the nature of love, loving kindness. And then some years later, I wrote a book called Faith, <coughs> so you can imagine. <laughs> There was nothing else to call the book, really. Um, some of you have probably uh, met Stephen Batchelor when he's been up here uh, teaching in this community. 
and he gave me a piece of advice at one point. He said, don't call it faith. <laughs> he said, call it trust. You'll be better off. Um, and he was probably right, but I really wanted to call it faith. <laughs> because of so many words, I mean, there was something that, you know, had come to mean for many people something very different from what I was trying to convey, which I considered the essence of faith. Again, from the Buddhist tradition, um, the word that is translated commonly as faith is sada, S-A-D-D-H-A, and it means to offer one's heart, to place one's heart upon something. And its most profound meaning is a sense of looking deeply within and having faith in capacities we are said to all have for connection, for clarity, for wisdom, for love, and faith in a bigger picture of life so that we're not defined by the immediate circumstance we may be facing. But of course, for many people, faith had come to mean or be associated with ideas like being silenced, not being able to ask any questions, not being allowed any doubt, not having faith in themselves. So the point wasn't to investigate and probe and discover for oneself, but to simply rely on the words of another. And so I spent a lot of time trying, in effect, to um, look at my own associations with that word and to have people look at theirs to see, you know, can we discover a quality of faith which is enhanced by doubt and not threatened or uh, destroyed by doubt? Can we have a quality of faith that is about asking questions and insisting on knowing the truth for ourselves rather than just relying on the words of another? And so that was the, the exploration around all of that. And then years went by, you know, and I wrote these different books and uh, lived my life and, <laughs> and was teaching. And then, uh, of course, came my most recent book, uh, Real Happiness. All this is leading to my invitation to Alan to speak about patience, which is another malign, oft maligned word. <laughs> So this book, as many of you know, I'm sure I've uh, talked about it before in this community, um, this book was originally called something else. It was called Why Meditate? Because it's actually kind of about why meditate. Some of the science and the uh, benefits of meditation and the how-to program and all of that. And then time went on in the in the publication cycle before it came out, when I received an advanced copy of a, a book from written by a friend of mine, which was called, Why Meditate? <laughs> <laughs> so there was a pretty big scramble to try to find another title, and the publisher came up with Real Happiness, and which you know I, I certainly accepted. And I was kind of, to be perfectly frank, I was pretty torn about. On the one hand, it seemed it was absolutely perfect as a title, because what do we really want, actually, but real happiness? But on the other hand, I thought, I'm going to get into big trouble <laughs> with this title. And sure enough, I got into big trouble, which was maybe encapsulated by Somewhere when I was on the book tour um, for the book, somebody pointed out to me the bumper sticker which says something like, if you're not depressed, you're not paying attention. <laughs> and, and some association, of course, of happiness with being kind of stupid and happy-go-lucky and frivolous and only seeking your own pleasure and not caring about the suffering, being conflict-avoidant not willing to face some of the, you know, truly terrible, horrific pain that goes on in life and the uncertainty and, and all of that. And, um, and yet, I really felt strongly, just as I felt about all these other ideas and, and titles and, and concepts, 
that we maybe need to take another look at happiness and take it away from just the, the realm of pleasure and pleasure seeking and endless pleasure seeking and go deeper to first of all understand that in a way you could say we have a right to be happy. Everybody wants to be happy. That we all actually want something. We want a sense of belonging in this life. We want a very different sense of strength. We want something that will allow us to recognize that we are a part of something greater than our usually limited sense of self. We want to be happy, and that's okay. That's not wrong, that's not embarrassing, that's something we should, not something we should feel squeamish about or, or ashamed of. We all want to be happy in a way we all deserve to be happy. The problem, of course, is ignorance that we and really pretty much everyone more or less doesn't have a clue very often as to where happiness, real happiness, more enduring happiness, more stable happiness could be found. And so we flounder and we, we want and we hold on and we push away. And, but the problem is not the urge toward happiness, the problem is the ignorance. Because happiness in this deeper sense of happiness is like a wellspring. Where does generosity come from? It doesn't come from a place of feeling, I don't have enough, I will never have enough. I'm living in deprivation, I'm living in, in some state of deficiency. That's not the state that allows us to so easily give. I mean, maybe we give because we feel compelled or, you know, something like that. But, but that real kind of generosity has to have that sense of inner abundance. That's happiness. It's a source of resiliency. Getting through some really, really hard times without feeling so broken forever. Having that wellspring, resourcefulness, abundance, that's happiness. In the, in the sense that I think we really want it, that's real happiness. And I think for any of these words, um, any of these ideas, it takes a lot to step away from the ordinary sense of things. You know, my conventional sense of patience, for example, before I turn it around, is something a little dull. Um, kind of like gritting your teeth and enduring, not something very alive or vital, right? So it takes a lot to step away from those ideas and, and conventional definitions and say, Okay, if I really want to be happy, let me take a look at this, which I've always kind of rejected or, or demeaned in some way or dismissed. What about that, which I held on to so fervently, and oh, look at that, maybe it's not causing me any great pleasure after all, now that I'm, I'm much more aware. And so um, I'm very intrigued uh, to have patience added to that realm of profound investigation. So, you can turn the mic. <laughs>